Hi, I'm Sean. I'm Mark. And I'm Brenna. And we're here to talk about two new shows. We have CBS's Golden Boy and NBC's Do No Harm. Let's start with Golden Boy. Detective Clark, day one, how does it feel? It's my dream to be in Homicide. So I know you come in here real green, but if you keep your ears open, I'll give you a fair shake. This job is filled with tough calls. I can handle it. So Golden Boy revolves around Walter William Clark Jr., who's a detective in the NYPD who has a meteoric rise over the course of seven years, which we see through flashbacks, to become the youngest police commissioner ever. That's right. And as you pointed out, our playground is New York City. It's a single camera show. It's an hour episodic police procedural. That's right. Another one on CBS. The premise is solid. You know, it's a basic cop show. It's kind of hard to mess up that premise. But the writing is a bit weak and at times it can even be a bit cliched. The writing was bothersome. The thing that I, I, I don't think the cast really gelled in the first couple episodes, and even worse than that is that somebody's got to teach them how to, let's just have an accent and stick with that <laughs> point, okay? Because nobody really knows what accent they're using. The only person that really got the accents down was Shy McBride, yeah. and actually Bonnie Somerville was the only other one that had a believable accent in this show. Yeah, Theo James, who I believe is British, uh, it sometimes sounds like he's doing a, a typical American accent and then a New York American <laughs> accent. We've seen this before, this young cop, rises in the ranks, people are jealous of him. I mean, it's been all throughout literature, and you could read a James Elroy novel, you could watch L.A. Confidential, maybe you could watch Cop Rock. I, I don't know if, that was, if this was in Cop Rock, but <laughs> we've seen it before. At least I felt like I had seen it before. For what this was, though, I thought it gave it a good effort. The writing is extremely cliched and painfully expositional. Like, every conversation was explaining something that, you, that they feel the audience should know. You've only been on the job three years. You'd be the least experienced by a decade. Kid, you haven't made your bones. Speaking plain, I made my bones from the age of nine, stealing food from me and my sister, and then working two jobs to get through John Jay. The only thing they do to put a spin on an old formula is they put this flashback structure in there, but it doesn't help the show, really. I mean, it, it's, I guess, supposed to bring intrigue and suspense, but it doesn't. I mean, he's got a limp seven years later, so we're supposed to be like, ooh, we're going to be glued to the television over the course of however many seasons because we really want to know how this guy, you know, got a limp. <laughs> I don't care. I just don't care. And and really, that's the only thing they do to try and make it different. I did like the flashback element, though, because you see how he meets his kind of mentor, played by Shy McBride, right. who's fantastic in the show. Oh, yeah. He might be the best thing about it. And they're really not connecting at all. And I don't know if that, that's not just the cast not gelling. That's actually supposed to be in the story. And seven years later, they're going to be really good buddies. And maybe we don't know what that relationship has, but it seems like maybe something happened to Shy McBride's character. So... I want to see how that relationship progresses. So in that element, I did like the flashback. Shy yeah. McBride was really good. I just, I felt they kind of didn't use him enough. I mean, he was pretty much the mentor. That's mm -hmm. all he yes. was. He existed as, I believe you said, he is an Obi-Wan Kenobi type. And that's yes. all he is. Even though he's doing a cliched mentor role, he makes it interesting. And that's impressive. And if there's anything keeping the show's head above water, he's the guy. Sorry, it's been like so months. Yeah, what are you going to do? Oh my, Morgan Freeman, open your own damn door. So our showrunner is Nicholas Wooten, who has got a lot of experience doing these kind of TV shows. He's done Chuck and Law and & Order and NYPD Blue, and he seems more than capable. It's pretty much standard cop procedural fare, but there's some, some sweeping shots around like the interrogation table. There's a shot of like on a guy's chest as he's standing up, which was a little interesting. It's good for the typical CBS audience, yeah, which I is above so. 70, so maybe so. we can do some stuff to appeal to the younger kids. Golden Boy has a lot of problems, but it made one great decision. They cast Shy McBride. Maybe they can give him a lot more to do. For right now, stream it. I totally understand police drama fatigue at this point, especially from a network, but in Nicholas Wooten, I trust, and I like the flashback element, so I'm going to give this a stream it. With all of the good cop shows on TV, we don't really need another one, and this one isn't really worth a look. Skip it. All right, well, it looks like our votes head up to one ticket, which is a stream it for CBS's Golden Boy. All right, let's talk about Do No Harm now. My name is Dr. Jason Cole. At least it is right now. But every night, at the same time, he becomes me. Ian Price. We share the same body, but we are not the same. Do No Harm is a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde story that takes place in Philadelphia. It's a serialized one-hour drama 
premiering on NBC. That's right. It's from showrunner David Schulner, who also was the writer on the event and trauma. So he knows his way around weird medical experiences. You have a doctor who... For a, at the beginning of the show, is sleeping for 12 hours at night between the hours of 8:25 p.m. and 8:25 a.m. Self-induced coma. Self-induced coma because he turns into Ian Price, who's a sadistic, crazy dude. Here you go, Cole. Be careful. Monkeys have been known to eat their young. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> How did he become a doctor? How is it that the hospital staff is perfectly fine with him just basically disappearing for 12 hours at night without ever being on call? He has diabetes. He has diabetes, but I guess he never had residency. He didn't do anything like that. Well, yeah, no doctor has ever been able to sleep for 12 hours straight. But and become a doctor. He's painted as this all-star, like this brilliant surgeon, right. so maybe they give him a pass. I can understand maybe if a couple people, like his boss, knew and was keeping it under wraps to help him, but the only person who knows is some, is some guy in a lab who's making his coma medicine for him. He had, does have a crazy double life, and it is very absurd, but it's fun to watch, too. It's not just like a boring medical show on a network. You get all this cool other stuff that, at times, it can feel just like you're watching like another sequel to The Hangover, because you have to wake up right. and figure out what he did last night. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what it should be. It, it, it could be that. I think the show right now, at least in the first two episodes, is taking itself far too seriously. And it's trying to be too many things at once. You really have this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story, but you also have medical procedures going on with each episode, almost like it wants to be another house. We have not only the split personality, but he's going in and doing surgery on a guy who can't recognize people's faces. And then in episode two, a girl who has a worm in her brain. And I'm just going, I don't care. Get to the stuff <laughs> that could be fun. There's you don't just, care about a girl with a worm in her brain? I would care about it if it wasn't interfering with the best part of the show. <laughs> You're messing with Ian Price. You're messing up with a hot chick. This guy, yeah. Ian Price, which could be really, really funny if they go with it. And he's been suppressing Ian for five years. Which means that he's been taking coma medication every night for five years, and there's so many risks to putting yourself comatose. And you're kind of wondering what's going to happen if this thing ever does get out. Is he going to hulk out again? And from the pilot episode, you're like, oh, he's just going to become a crazy sex addict. That doesn't sound all that bad. But what I liked is that they started there, and then he ended up doing these other things. And what I liked watching was seeing the Hyde part kind of mess with the Jekyll part. Then the Jekyll part has to answer by doing something to screw up Hyde's life. So they're, they're right. kind of, it's like two guys that really don't like each other. Uh, having a rivalry. In his performance as playing two different characters, he does a good job of not delivering these lines in a cliche manner. So while the dialogue itself is cliche, the way he delivers it works. And his performance is actually top notch. So despite some issues with believability, it's just fun to watch these two halves of the same guy try to destroy each other. So I say stream it. I'm a fan. I'm in. I loved watching the medical stuff and even more the Jekyll and Hyde personalities. I think there's going to be a lot of layers to not only the Dr. Jekyll, but the Mr. Hyde part of this show. I say see it. Well, Do No Harm is pretty absurd, but if it embraced that aspect, it could be a really fun show. Right now, it's taking itself too seriously, so I have to say stream it. Our votes add up to two full tickets, which is a stream it for Do No Harm. All right, Jeez. let's hurry up. In five minutes, I turn into a different person. I gotta get home and do a self-induced coma. I like the medical stuff, too, but maybe it would be easier if you had a Jekyll and Hyde personality if you just worked at Subway. <laughs> They're open 24 hours, though. <laughs> oh, shit. That's right. It's gonna get crazy at night.